Hello, welcome to Delta's webinar about using load cells with the RMC200. This webinar will be recorded for viewing later. Delta now has a new LC8 module for the RMC200 that supports load cells. This is very new. It was released in October of 2021, just a few months ago. You can see a picture of the LC8 module here. Excuse me. The LC8 module can connect to eight load cell inputs. We see some of the specs here, five millivolts per volt, wire sense input, eight kilohertz internal sampling. Of course, the sampling that received data is typically the loop time of the controller. A 24-bit accuracy of plus minus 15 parts per million of the full-scale range is typical and the uh, exciter output voltage is given here. We will be going through some of these concepts here, so don't worry if you don't understand them. Um, and if you're advanced, we do have some advanced topics to cover as well. Uh, let's see, I think I skipped a page there, sorry. Um, we will cover the LC8 module today, and we will go through load cell fundamentals, including the strain gauge and Wheatstone bridge, how that works, wiring, configuring load cells in RMC tools, and we also will do live control of a hydraulic cylinder with a load cell. And we also touch on multi-point calibration using custom feedback. So kind of the full range of applications using load cell with the RMC 200. For the LC8 module, we list some of the specs here. We have more full specs on this page, and that's also available in the data sheet. I would like to point out that the uh, overall nonlinearity is plus minus 15 parts per million of full scale range. That's typical. Um, that's fairly good accuracy. However, if you do use the load cell, um, you have to keep in uh, mind the gain drift with temperature. We also have specs of that. So we have about minus 50 parts per million per degree C. So if you just go up and down a few degrees C, you can see your plus minus 15 part per million may change. Um, so if you're really into high accuracy, you may have to have a panel or electrical uh, enclosure that is temperature controlled. The plus minus 15 parts per million is roughly equivalent to 16 bits. Um, now, typically we talk about 16 bits in terms of resolution. There's a big difference between resolution and accuracy, um, but plus minus 15 parts per million is approximately 16 bits. I want to point out that before we had the LC8 module, we could always use load cells with the RMCs, whether it's the RMC70, 150, 200, whatever, you just have to connect to an amplifier and then to the load cell. So now we can connect the load cell directly to the RMC200. Um, big advantage of that is that we can reduce cost and panel real estate. So here is a picture that was sent to us from our distributor, CMA Flowdyne Hydrodyne. Um, very nicely laid out cabinet, clean wiring. You can see the signal conditioners take up a lot of space in the cabinet and cost. I, you know, I don't know what a signal conditioner costs, maybe roughly $300 each. You can get them you know, more or less. Um, so that, that's a fair amount of cost that can be saved by using the LC8 module directly. We will cover some load cell basics. Here's some pictures of a few load cells. There are all kinds of sizes and shapes of load cells. Load cells are usually made of strain gauges. There are other technologies, um, but in our world of hydraulic motion control, <clears throat> we typically run into strain gauge load cells. So that's what we'll cover. So strain gauge basics. It starts out with a wire. And a wire has a characteristic that the resistance is proportional to its length. And the resistance is also inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. So that means a longer wire has more resistance, a thinner wire has more resistance, and a thicker wire has less resistance. So if we pull on this wire, it of course becomes longer and thinner. Longer means the resistance goes up and thinner means the cross-sectional area decreases and the resistance increases. So we bond this wire to a metal beam 
look at the side of this, it's bonded right to it. When it bends, the top of the beam extends, the bottom of the beam compresses, becomes shorter, the top is longer. So this load cell, or, or sorry, this, this wire on the top of the beam becomes longer, area becomes smaller because it stretches, and the resistance goes up. So in this way, we can see that the resistance changes when the beam bends due to a force bending it, and so we can use that to measure the force. Now, in reality, what we do is we take that wire and we bend it back and forth many times so that when the beam bends, we get a more significant change in the resistance of this wire. Now, the resistance of a wire is in itself somewhat difficult to use. Electronic circuitry works a lot better sensing the voltages rather than changes in resistance. So what is typically done is that a Wheatstone bridge is employed. A Wheatstone bridge is a circuit that's used with sensors that experience a change in resistance. And not only strain gauges, but all kinds of different sensors. So in this case with strain gauges that change resistance, we use Wheatstone bridge. And it converts that change in resistance to voltage. The way it works is like this. It starts out with a simple voltage divider just a couple of resistors and a constant voltage source on top. If these resistors are the same value, that means this voltage in the middle will be half of five volts. So V1 is five volts divided by two. Now what we do, we add a similar voltage divider in parallel. So it has the same voltage on top, you know, goes to zero volts on the bottom, and if these resistors here are all the same, and so this sensor that can change resistance, if its nominal value is the same, nominal being what it is when it's not really measuring anything, then V1 and V2 will be the same. But as the resistance changes, what will happen is this V2 voltage will change and we will have a voltage differential here that we can measure that changes as the resistance changes. So what we do is we replace this, uh, this resistor here with our strain gauge that we just talked about. And now as the strain gauge changes resistance, we can measure a voltage output. And that's the voltage that is, 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 indicates what the force is. Now typically, Wheatstone bridges are not written like this. They're typically written in this way, but this is the exact same thing as this. We see that we have an excitation voltage that we apply, and this needs to be a constant, accurate voltage that's applied. And then we have our strain gauge here, for example. So here's a little example of how it can work. Um, we have a beam, and we have strain gauges mounted on it, four of them. And the Wheatstone bridge is like this. We see that red one is over here, R1, R2 down there. We put it here. But then we flip it around. R3 here we put on the top, R4 we put on the bottom. Now, as this beam bends, the resistance of R1 and R4 goes up because it become longer. Resistance of R2 and R3 goes down. Let's see what happens over here. This strain gauge resistance goes up that one resistance goes down, so the voltage here will go down. Now on the opposite end, R3 goes down, so it goes down here. Resistance of R4 goes up, so that means the voltage at this point will go up. So we get a bigger differential here that we can measure more accurately what that voltage is. Now this is just an example. Um, there's many different ways to configure strain gauges to measure force. And I don't know if there's actually any that are done exactly this way. They usually add other things in there, some resistors. They need to do things for temperature compensation, um, also to compensate for forces that are in a different direction to make sure we're accurately measuring the correct force. So this is just an example. Uh, let's see here. I believe I have a uh, website that has some cool pictures.
Um, here's some examples of how strain gauges can be put on some kind of a, a piece of metal. Um, there's a couple here. Notice there are different orientations here. And maybe we have one on the top, one on the bottom. Um, sometimes we actually have just dummy strain gauges. Uh, whoops instead of actual real strain gauges for various reasons. Um, here we have a, four of them, different orientations. Here we have top and bottom. And we can even have on a cylinder for measuring torsion. And all of these methods, when they actually get put into a load cell, um, you know, it depends where that piece of metal inside the load cell that bends is located. So it varies a lot, um, but the basics are as I described it here. So if we have this load cell, this Wheatstone bridge with strain gauges, the output V out here is in millivolts. That's a very small voltage. Load cell outputs are typically specified not in millivolts, but is in millivolts per volt. So that means that it's relative to the excitation voltage. Now, at the rated load of a load cell, let's say it's a 10,000 pound load cell, V out will be the number of millivolts per volt specified by the manufacturer times the excitation voltage. So for example, let's say we have a 5,000 pound load cell and it gives two millivolts per volt at 5,000 pounds. So if we have an excitation voltage of 10 volts, that means at 5,000 pounds, we will see two millivolts per volt times 10 volts equals 20 millivolts. That will be our V out. And of course, as we change the value of the load, um, we'll get varying numbers out. So minus 5,000, we'll get minus 20 millivolts, 5,000 will get 20 millivolts out. That's what the electronics on the motion controller will measure from the load cell. And of course it varies in between here. Now let's say we have a different excitation voltage, for example, five volts. Well, now at minus 5,000, we'll get minus 10 millivolts or at 5,000 we'll get 10 millivolts. And of course values in between. So we see it varies based on the excitation. But regardless of whether we have a 10 volt exciter or five volt exciter or 6.75 like the LC8, the output, if we look at it in millivolts per volt, that will be constant. So for a 10 volt exciter, five volt exciter, the max load negative will be minus two millivolts per volt or positive at two or at minus 1000 pounds, we'll have minus 0 0.4 millivolts per volt. So the millivolts per volt is the value from the load cell that we look at basically. Um, so the motion controller or PLC or whatever circuitry, it looks at the millivolts divided by the uh, excitation voltage and that is the value that we see. So for example, if we look at a calibration sheet, this is actually a calibration sheet for the load cell I have on my system right now. It's from Interface Force. We see that its rated output in tension is 3.22 millivolts per volt. And it gives us a calibration at different loads. It tells us what the millivolts per volt reading is. So again, the millivolts per volt is the important one. It doesn't matter what the excitation voltage is, we will still get the same relative signal in millivolts per volt for each of these loads. Um, we can also see in our RMC tool software, if we look at the axis tools, our pressure force feedback for load cell, we'll go through all this configuration here later, um, but we have this millivolts per volt signal. That is the important one. That's the one we look at, and that's the one we use to convert to force values. So if we have a load cell and we connect the excitation voltage to it, let's say for example, it's 10 volts, then we wire the input to the RMC 
from the output of the load cell. That's the input millivolts that the, the uh, circuitry is measuring. The millivolt per volt input is, as we learned, the input millivolts divided by the excitation voltage, so that's 10. Being that the strain gauges have resistance, very common value, I believe is 350 ohms, and there's other ones that are real common, we will get some current that flows through the load cell and then back. Well, if this excitation voltage wire is long, then we will have a voltage drop across it. And so instead of the voltage across the load cell being 10 volts like we sent here, the actual voltage, if we measure it, maybe it's, for example, only 9.9 .9 volts. So a long excitation wire can cause an inaccurate excitation voltage at the load cell. So if we want to calculate our millivolts per volt input, and it's actually not 10, it's 9.9, .9, well, if we use 10, we will have an inaccurate measurement. So what we do is we add these sense wires that are used just to measure the actual voltage out at the load cell. Now the controller can do the calculation and it uses the input millivolts that it measures plus the, or divided by the measured excitation voltage. Now we get a very accurate millivolt per volt input. Note that if you have relatively short wires, the voltage drop is insignificant, um, so you don't necessarily have to use wire compensation. In the RMC motion controller, we have several options for that. Now that we've done a little review of load cells, the wiring for the LC8 is very simple. You have the load cell, you connect the excitation plus and minus wires to the correct pins, and the uh, output goes to the input plus and minus. The shield of the wire goes to the case pin on the LC8 typically. And wire shielding is important. These small millivolt signals that come out from the load cell to the input are very small and very susceptible to noise. So we wanna make sure that wire is shielded correctly. Now there are also load cells with six wires and those basically have added wiring for the sense inputs. So notice here on the LC8, we do something a little bit different than what I just described on how the sensing works. The LC8 measures only one side of the load cell, the bottom side here. And so it's basically measuring the voltage drop along this exciter minus wire. Now, if the exciter plus wire is the same length and gauge, that voltage drop will be the same as the exciter minus voltage drop. So if we just measure one side of it and then uh, calculate what the drop is in the other one, assume it's identical, then we will get the voltage out here correctly. The uh, other wire, you just don't connect at all to the RMC. Now this works just fine as long as the excitation wire length and gauge is identical. The reason we've done this is so that we could fit more inputs on the LC8 module. Um, we get rid of a pin, um, we get rid of some internal circuitry as well, and then we can fit eight inputs much better on the LC8 module. And the accuracy is basically not affected. So when we configure a load cell input in RMC tools, we have a couple things we need to look at. One is the exciter mode. So as I described, we have several different ways of dealing with it. We have one option called nominal. That means we don't use compensation. So it just assumes the excitation voltage is the voltage calibrated at the factory. Um, I mentioned before that 6.75 volts. And uh, recall from the explanation here that the exact value of the excitation voltage doesn't make any difference. The larger the voltage, the easier it is to get accurate readings from an analog to digital converter. Um, but with the modern analog to digital converters, um, the accuracy is much higher, so we don't necessarily need to use as high a value as was used in the past. Um, 10 volts is very common. I've seen 20 volts, 
Um, five volts is common. We did 6.75 volts. What that does is gives us a reasonably high number for good accuracy. Um, but the higher the the uh, voltage, the more internal heat that we have to dissipate, and that causes problems when we try to shove eight load cell inputs into our module um, at the uh, highest temperature rating of the controller. So 6.75 was a good uh, compromise. At the factory, we measure exactly what the excitation voltage is, and it's not going to be exactly 6.75. It might be 6.7432198 or something similar, but that's what you do when you choose nominal. You assume that the excitation voltage is what the factory calibration uh, measured for that module. Fixed exciter mode. What we do there is you measure it once during setup and then continually use that value. Um, this works just fine because typically your wire resistance won't change. And as you measure it at the beginning, whether you use measure it with your own multimeter or use RMC's measurement, either or, um, just put that value in there and it's good to go. We also have adaptive mode for the exciter where it uses the measured sense value. And this value is updated either every milliseconds or nine loop times, whichever is greater. And whichever exciter mode we use, we can see in RMC tools what that effective exciter voltage is. So let's go look at that. So in the status registers, on the all tab on the feedback, we have this effective exciter voltage. So this one happens to be 6.721. Um, if I look over here in the right exciter mode, notice this is on secondary control setup because I'm using a position force axis. I happen to have this set to adaptive. And we have those other values here, nominal, fixed value, and adaptive. If I choose fixed value, then I can enter the fixed exciter voltage here, whether I measure it with my own multimeter, or if I actually just physically look at this item, number 6.721, copy it and paste it in there. Um, for right now, we're actually using adaptive here. The second thing we have to do in configuring your load cell input is do the scale and offset. So that's not a very complicated setup. We just had to set the exciter mode and then the scale and offset. So as usual, the scale and offset values convert the raw feedback to whatever units. So the millivolts per volts to force units and typically we use the scale offset wizard. I would like to point out that we do have a negative correction factor. Um, this adjusts the gain on the negative side of bi-directional load cells. Typically the gain on bi-directional load cells varies very slightly from the positive side to the negative side. And the scale offset wizard takes into account setting the negative correction factor. So let's take a look at that. In the axis tools for whichever axis we happen to have the load cell on, and uh, this one we have it on axis zero. We have the pressure force scale offset wizard. Of course, this is just force here. We have two different options. We can either use the calibration data. This is assuming that we have the calibration sheet and we can do unidirectional loading or bidirectional loading, you know, depending on whether we have a tension or compression or both. If I choose bidirectional loading, from the calibration sheet, we can enter the requested information. Um, so if I look at that sheet here, um, we have positive force, um, let's see, capacity was 5,000 pounds and tension was 3.22, compression is minus 3.22 or 377. Now I have this one set up so that compression would actually be positive. So if I look at positive force 5,000, we will enter in three, well, looks like I have to remember that number, 22551, so 3.22. 22551. Negative force at minus 5,000. Let's go see what that is. That's uh, no, that was wrong. I uh, need to put that one in the negative force 
there. And that's a compression, I have positive. So 3.22377, 22377. And then we want to enter the zero balance. That's how many millivolts per volt are output at zero force. And we have the zero balance listed here somewhere. I thought, did you use the term zero balance? Okay, it gives uh, that label there. Um, but looks like at zero force, um, basically have zero millivolts per volt. Um, notice there's a little hysteresis as they go up to force and then come down. It's a little bit different, uh, but we'll just put zero in there. Click next. And these are the force scale and offset and the negative correction factor in there. Click next, finish, and we see that it changed the value there, the force scale. Um, the negative correction factor, I think it's on the all tab, secondary feedback there, we see a negative correction factor. So I download that, and that applies the changes. I'm going to just uh, tell the axis to hold position so it doesn't drift. When I downloaded it, it went into open loop. So that was all the setup that you have to do in the axis parameters. We have the exciter mode, and then we have the scale and offset. Um, I'll show you a little bit here. This RMC200 we have has a few different modules. Um, we have an A8, S8, CA4, which is analog inputs, SSI. So we're actually connected to a position. CA4 is the... Uh, analog output the valve, and here we added the LC8 module for the load cell. And our axes are defined in this way. Axis zero is a position force axis with SSI position input and load cell secondary input. Um, I also have a reference axis that is using the pressure sensors on this cylinder for the differential force and we will be able to see that a load cell is more accurate than the differential force. During operation, um, we control force just as usual. Um, I would like to point out that we have a set actual force command that can be used to set the zero value. So if you have some tooling that's hanging off the load or you know things just drift, the beginning of each cycle you may want to zero the force or set the tear and we use a set actual force command for that so let's run this a little bit um, i have a camera here pointed to our load cell we have a little load cell here with a little button and the cylinder pointing to it so we will uh, run into that and control force start the trend here i am at about 15 inches somewhere around 20 21 inches i think is going to hit the load cell i have a user program here that is used to enter force it moves to position of 21 um, waits for the actual position to become greater than 19.5 and then it continues that same move but at a slower speed so we start at 10 we slow down 0.5 so we don't want to hit that load cell really fast. Once the actual force starts increasing, then we go to the next step and enter pressure force control. We use auto that will um, seamlessly do that. Um, the auto version of enter pressure force control should only be used when the axis is actually moving. And then once we get to force, we actually ramp the force up and down between 4,000 and 1,000. And that just continues forever. So if I start that user program here, we'll do enter force. So we see here that the position increased. I'll stop this, we can analyze it a little bit. So the target position moved, and then once we hit 19.5, we slowed down. 
And as the force started increasing right here, the black line is the actual force. We see that uh, we entered force control, so our target force jumped down to where we actually were. And the target force smoothly ramps to the requested value here, which uh, let's see if I click target force, looks like it was a thousand. And force stayed there for a while, ramped up, ramped down. Very normal for our force control. I'll uh, send a command to stop that user program so it's not ramping up and down anymore. So if we look at the force right now, it's holding 4,000 pounds. Uh, when we look at the scale here, we're 4,000 and that's 4,000.5 pounds right here and 3,999.5 pounds. We are holding within plus minus one pound here at 4,000 pounds. Um, that's reasonably good control. If I ramp down, let's go ramp down to uh, 1,000 pounds. Um, now we're down there. Um, let's see, I'll zoom in here. Um, we have our new vertical zooming that we can use. You'll see is control shift plus the mouse wheel. So I'll use control shift plus the mouse wheel being I'm on the force and I can zoom in. And let's see what we're holding here. So we're at a thousand. Notice that it's bouncing a little bit beyond 1001 and beyond 999. In the last plot we looked at, it wasn't bouncing quite as far. So we found this easier to do accurate force control at higher pressures um, or at higher forces, at least on this cylinder. I think it probably has to do with seals and how they work. That's maybe not necessarily intuitive that at 4,000 pounds, we we're holding about plus minus a half. And here we're holding about plus minus one. Now we can also see as we zoom in, um, if I look at the control output, we'll zoom into there. The control output is very small when we're doing force control, static force control at least. Uh, if I zoom in here, we can see that, uh, let's see, it's about, about 0.58 and we're only doing plus minus well, about 0.05% um, percent output. So very small. But we can see how the, the uh, control output behaves, um, how finally we can control the force has to do with the sensitivity of the valve and of course also the size of the valve. If I have a very, very small valve, it's easier to control force exactly. Of course, if we ramp force up and down in the uh, camera here, we can't really see anything because it's not moving very far. One thing I want to show is ramping force up and down while also looking at the differential force from the pressure sensors on the load cell. So I want to talk about that a little bit. There's two main ways to control force with a cylinder. One is with the load cell and one is with pressure sensors. So the great advantage of a load cell is that it's very accurate. Some of the disadvantages are that the mounting is a little bit more difficult. Somehow you have to get it between the rod and your load. Sometimes that's dirt simple, sometimes it's not so simple. But we always need to deal with cable management. That load cell is typically out there moving, so we have to have a cable connected and make sure that that cable is managed properly. With dual pressure sensors used to calculate the resulting force, the advantages are is that it's rugged. It's not out there with the moving load. It's on the cylinder, often that can be protected a bit more. And the cabling is very simple because the cylinder is typically not moving much. You might have it pivoting on the cylinder or something, but, but it's typically less than the load cell. The great disadvantage is that the pressure sensors here do not account for seal friction. So on the hydraulic cylinder, that uh, I'm using here. The friction, oh, we can't see a cylinder back here, but we figure the friction is very roughly a 
100 pounds. You know, it varies quite a bit depending on temperature and so on, but very approximately that. So as we move the system, the force indicated by the pressure sensors, it kind of sometimes is more than load cell or sometimes less than load cell, and we can never get it real accurate compared to the load cell. So let's see if we look at some plots of that. I have this plot here where we are showing the target natural force from the load cell and the uh, actual force from the differential force. Um, so notice that the load cell is up here at 1,000 and the actual force on load cell is actually down at 850. Um, I believe this uh, the differential force is calibrated correctly. Um, could be there's an issue with this. Also, the load cell we have, it hasn't been calibrated since 2013, typically not an issue when we just need to demonstrate how things work, um, but there could be a little offset in this particular example from that. But if we ramp the uh, force up here, let's say to 4,000, um, we see that we have a little bit of an offset here. The offset up here is less than it was down there. Uh, let's see if we ramp down to 500, um, what happens? So there seems to be a continual offset here. From experience, I can say that if we try to adjust the differential force to match the load cell, it might work for a little bit, but temperature changes, we run a little bit, seals change, then it will be off maybe the other direction by just as much and becomes a very frustrating endeavor. Um, we can also sometimes see the effect of seal friction um, when we do uh, control here. Um, once we reach the final force, sometimes the load cell and the differential force will diverge and then sometimes come close to each other. Um, when we're controlling on the load cell, it doesn't work so well. Um, but if I switch the uh, control, let's see if I can do this here, from this project to another uh, controller that's actually controlling based off the, uh, the pressure sensors. Now it requires different axis definitions. That's why I have to uh, use this uh, different uh, project setup here. But we'll uh, download this one with the new axis definitions to the controller. So it's controlling based off the pressure sensors, not the load cell. And let's see, put that in run mode. I think we have a plot here. So we have axis zero. Um, let's see, I don't have the enter pressure force program. Maybe copy that one, stick it in here. We should be able to use that same program. Um, oh, I guess that wasn't. Let's see. Yeah, okay, that's better. So let's see what happens when we run that. We move the axis. It uh, was in force control, ramps up and down. So now you see the effect a little bit here that I was talking about. So we're controlling with the black line, the force control based off the pressure sensors. And so it shows it being real accurate, comes down here and hits the force in real straight. But look at what our load cell shows. The load cell shows that the force is actually changing after we reach our constant force. And we assume that's because the uh, seal friction, the cylinder is kind of settling out um, and the actual force isn't what we think it is based on the differential force sensors. So that was just a, a brief example of that. It's sometimes very interesting to look at systems with load cell versus pressure sensors. Um, indicates that if you're controlling force with differential uh, pressure sensors, that you need to be very cognizant of the cylinder seals causing changes. I want to touch on a few other topics here.
Um, Multi-point calibration is the first one. So we did scale and offset with just the scale offset wizard that just did a scale offset and then had an adjustment for the negative side of the load cell. We can do multi-point calibration I have another project here that's set up for that. So we'll use this project here. Go online with the controller and download that. So using multi-point calibration requires using custom feedback. That's a feature we have. Um, it requires changing the axis definition. So if we look at the axis definitions here, we will see that I have my axis zero, that's using a position force axis with SSI as a primary input for position, and then the secondary input for force is called custom. So that means we can make it whatever we want, but we have to use a user program that assigns the value to it. Then we have a reference axis, that's actually getting the input from the load cell. So we're gonna make a user program that uses that load cell input and sticks it into the Access Serial Custom Feedback. So that user program here is Custom Feedback. Um, this is the code, I won't go into it in detail. We have uh, information on our forum about how to set up Custom Feedback and some example projects with user programs that do that. Um, but we're actually using a curve to get the values and sticking them in the custom counts. So we'll see here the curves. I have a curve listed right here that uses, let's say I threw in the description here a little bit, um, expand that. So we use pounds, thousand pounds force versus millivolts per volt. Um, looks like I have the thousands there, so I should actually just call that pounds force versus millivolts per volt. So the x-axis, that's the millivolts per volt that we get from the load cell, and the y-axis is how many thousand pounds we get out of it. So if we look at that uh, calibration sheet again for our load cell, I used these values here in thousands of pounds, and then the tension and compression, um, which basically becomes negative thousand of pounds. Now you see that we have two values for zero and two values for 2000. I use the uh, first values here, um, hard to select those, because we typically will uh, be using the force control when we're increasing the force. So same as here is increasing. Negative, you get a little bit of hysteresis. Um, we'll typically use those first values. So just to illustrate what that calibration data actually is, I made an Excel spreadsheet where I put those values in the force, the millivolts per volt, and then uh, I did just a single line, you know, I call it a regression value, um, based on the static error band value that the uh, calibration data sheet set. Um, that defines what the straight line would should look like for best result. And then I did an error in that. So the error between the values that the calibration data sheet show versus a straight line are listed here. So you see the error is very small. Um, that kind of indicates that the straight line is actually not entirely straight. It has a little bit of error in it. So that's the straight line that I did here. And now when we run this curve and do control, we will actually be using the calibrated force according to this data sheet. Um, some details on the curve here. We need to make sure this is a linearly interpolated curve, so it has straight lines between each point. And this uh, custom feedback user program, we need to make sure that it's always running. And of course, we first had to define our axes correctly to be able to use the custom feedback. And as far as running it with the plots, um, it uh, runs just like usual. I think we have this enter force program here. Um, let's see, we're actually totally in the force. So let's see if I move back. 
And now we run the user program. We can enter the force control. See that moves into force, the position does, starts rising, and now we are controlling force up and down. And this, of course, is with the calibrated value now that is more precise. Again, if you have any questions, so we do have a chat window, we'd be happy to have you put uh, questions in there. I'll try to answer them as we go. So in addition to multi-point calibration, um, we are able to wire individual strain gauges as well. If we look in RMC Tools, Help, and if we look at uh, Load Cells, Load Cell Fundamentals, this gives a little description of strain gauge, Wheatstone Bridge, basic load cell. And then at the bottom, we talk about using individual strain gauges. So to use a strain gauge, you need to have a bridge completion circuit. So you have the strain gauge, you get a bridge completion circuit that provides these other three resistors and the resistance values have to match your strain gauge. Common values are 120 or 350 ohms or also others. So you can have a single strain gauge, that's typically called a quarter bridge, two strain gauges, it's called a half a bridge. You can also use external excitation voltage. So you notice that our excitation voltage was 6.75 volts. Um, you can provide your own. There are sometimes reasons for that, depending on what the resistance of your strain gauge is, or maybe you want a little bit higher accuracy. Um, you can stick whatever voltage you want. You could stick five volts, 10 volts, 20 volts. You just have to make sure that the resulting millivolt input to the RMC is within the range of the RMC. And we have, of course, in RMC tools, the specs for the LC8 module. Um, let's see here. So the uh, input voltage range of the input relative to the exciter has to be within a certain range. Um, and the input range itself, we can do plus minus 33.75 millivolts. So for those of you who are very familiar with load cells and want to provide your own excitation, there is enough information here for you to uh, figure out what you're using there. It's also important to notice that the LC8's exciter output has a maximum of 80 milliamps per terminal block. So, so if we go to the wiring, um, we have two terminal blocks, the first one for the first four inputs, second one for the second four input, and the exciter output has a maximum of 80 milliamps per terminal block. So as you consider your uh, resistance of your strain gauges, as long as um, the exciter output from LC8 doesn't have to output more than 80 milliamps, you're good. Um, if you need more more than 80 milliamps, that's where you may want to consider your own excitation voltage. We also have something called the minimum input filter frequency. Um, this is kind of advanced. Uh, we don't expect many customers to use it. But in the load cell setting itself, if we go to modules, the uh, LC8 module, the properties there, we go to configuration. We have a minimum input filter frequency, and this has to do with the analog to digital converter that's used. It's a uh, sigma delta converter that uh, has uh, behavior that many people would think is a little bit strange, uh, but there's a minimum input filter frequency associated with that. And if you require very fast response to rapid force transients, you may want to increase the minimum input filter frequency. Um, otherwise, this is just automatically set by the controller based on the loop time uh, for optimum performance of, of most applications. Uh, but again, we don't expect many customers will need to set this at all. I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that it was there. Uh, let's see. I see there's some questions in the chat, um, but interestingly enough, I'm having a little bit of trouble reading it. Okay, let's see. 
So there is a couple of questions in the chat. Looks like I missed them. I apologize for that, but I can answer them. Um, question one, can you still use the sense feature if you have an external exciter voltage? Um, yes, I believe you can. Um, I wonder, I'm not sure that I'm aware of what voltage range that sense input can actually handle. Let's see if we have that information in the help. Um, LC8 module. We don't necessarily have that imp information. Um, I'll have to look into that, um, but I'm assuming uh, Actually, I don't know what the input range of that is. That's uh, good information. We'll have to make sure to add that to the specifications. Um, good question. Of course, uh, that's Norm, a longtime uh, user of RMCs. And of course, he would uh, ask a question that stumps me. Uh, second question, any plans for an RMC70 strain gauge module? Um, since we released the LC8, we have been getting requests for a load cell module for the RMC70. Um, so that's something we are considering. I um, appreciate the question. We will uh, chalk that up as another request for that. Third question, have you used or heard of anyone using a load pin load cell for force control? Was it successful? Um, I guess I can't say yes or no. Um, I know customers have used many different types of load cells. Um, the load pin, I would expect that customers have used that, but I don't know for sure. Uh, looks like, uh, one of our guys reported just now on, on the chat that he has used a load pin on a winch. Um, so we have done that, um, and it worked just fine. Um, you know, as long as you make sure that there isn't much slop, that typically helps work, make it work just fine. So yes, we have used load pin load cell successfully. So that is all that I have to cover today. Um, this is pretty much an uh, overview of the LC8 module uh, controlling load cells. As I mentioned, there's many different types of load cells and different configurations. And of course, the basic uh, force control features, force limit, all the advanced things, um, those can also be used when you're controlling force with load cells. And of course, cus customers have been using load cells they just need an amplifier to do with RMC until today with LC8. Uh, if you have any other questions, um, add them on the chat. I'll uh, wait a little bit longer to make sure that I've covered them all. We look forward to working with our customers with the LC8 module and load cells. Um, we do understand that the accuracy we have in load cells on our LC8 module is quite good. Um, so we're excited uh, for that, for the high performance applications. With that, I thank you very much for attending the webinar. I believe uh, Aaron may have some closing words for us. Thank you so much, Jacob. A great, great presentation. Really uh, enjoyed it. Thank you so much. We mentioned at the top that recordings are available and I will quickly go over where you can find those recordings. Um, so if you, the first place is if you go to deltamotion.com, uh, we have a dedicated webinars page. You can go to the webinars page. Um, it's located in the education area and you can see there are links there to all of the past webinars and this one will be posted shortly. We also have a discussion forum. I think we mentioned in passing, uh, there are a couple of great things on, on the discussion forum. We have examples of different user programs. Uh, if we have a chance to uh, check out other hydraulics components and we test them with our lab systems here, uh, we like to put what our findings were in the third-party recommendations area. 
and there's a webinar topic and here in the webinar topic uh, again in each of those is a link to past recordings and then finally Delta has a YouTube channel it's Delta motion control as you see there all one word and the uh, the recordings will appear there thank you so much uh, after this presentation you also have an opportunity to give us some feedback you'll get a survey that gives you the opportunity to maybe suggest some upcoming topics, some topics that we should we should cover in the future. We appreciate your time. We hope that we presented some valuable information and thanks for joining us today.